Alright guys, so for endocrine, I wanted to give you a little tutorial on the, dis the different hormones. So there's a lot of information to cover here. Uh, the little concept map right here is going to expand substantially. But thankfully, this little software that I use called MyDomo will allow me to uh, focus in at one, par one part at a time. So, in lecture, you've already learned that the hypothalamus is, I refer to it as the kingpin of endocrine glands. So, essentially, it bosses around the others, mainly through its manipulation of the anterior and posterior pituitary glands. Now, off the anterior pituitary, we get a number of hormones. Now, I only have the abbreviations here, simply for the sake of space, um, but you have all of these listed in your notes. So we have prolactin, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, growth hormone, and adrenocorticotropic hormone. The first one we're going to focus on is ACTH. So ACTH acts on the, endocrine, the adrenal gland, not the endocrine gland. The adrenal gland will give you mineralocorticoids, which is a class of hormone, and glucocorticoids, again, a class of hormone. The example here is cortisol for our glucocorticoids and aldosterone for our mineralocorticoids. Now, the aldosterone is going to work with the renal system to regulate water, so regulate our level of hydration. Specifically, aldosterone is going to help us increase water retention. Cortisol is going to work very differently. So cortisol is largely associated with our stress response. So when we're stressed, we're going to see things happen in the body like an increase in glucose concentration in the blood so that we have that glucose available to our tissues so that we can run faster away from a threat so that our heart can beat harder, our brain can work harder, all of those different things. But long-term cortisol secretion can lead to a decrease in immune response. So you can become immunosuppressed if you have high cortisol concentrations for a sustained period of time. For ACTH, this is really what I want you to know, right? Where does it come from? Right, it comes from anterior pituitary. What's the target tissue? So again, target tissue refers to the tissue that has the receptor for this specific hormone. What's the action of this hormone? So we get the release of mineralocorticoids and glucocorticoids like aldosterone and cortisol. And what are the actions of these two? Our next example, our next hormone we need to talk about is growth hormone. So growth hormone, as the name implies, is going to cause the body to grow. So this is a hormone that is released in large quantities as we're going through puberty, as we're going through growth spurts, things like that. And so it has a large number of actions in the body. I'm focusing on two main ones. So we see an increase in muscle growth, and we're also going to see an increase in blood glucose concentration. For the same reason as the stress response, we have to have blood glucose concentrations sustain a little higher than normal, simply because we're growing tissue, so we're going to use up a lot more energy than we normally would. So our next hormone is TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. And the name tells you where it's going to go. So this is going to stimulate the thyroid gland. Now the thyroid gland you're probably already familiar with. You've probably heard of someone who has hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. So again, hyper is high, hypo is low. So the thyroid gland secretes thyroid hormone. It also secretes another hormone called calcitonin. Um, and calcitonin will increase calcium deposition in the bone, so depositing calcium in the bone, taking it out of the blood. Um, I didn't include that on here, just simply for space, but you should know that as well. So our thyroid hormone, released again from the thyroid gland, is going to regulate our metabolism. So someone who has hyperthyroidism, 
their metabolism is going to run fast and they're going to have a hard time maintaining um, weight. So they're going to lose weight unintentionally. Someone who has hypothyroidism, so their thyroid hormone levels are lower than normal, are going to gain weight unintentionally and have a hard time losing it simply because their metabolism is not being regulated appropriately. So our FSH is our follicle stimulating hormone and our LH is our luteinizing hormone. Both of these hormones are going to act on the gonads. Now there's a lot of detail here that we'll get into in the reproductive system. So keep in mind that if you're reading this and you're thinking, well, she's leaving out little bits or you know connections other places, I'm doing that intentionally simply because I'm focusing on the straightforward function um, listed here because um, we're going to learn all the extra details later on. So FSH is follicle stimulating hormone, as I just said. The follicle we're referring to is the immature sperm and the immature egg. So when FSH acts on the gonads, so again, gonads are only ever testicle and ovary. They don't include any of the other reproductive organs. So gonads, by definition, are sex cell producing organs. So when FSH acts on the gonads, we're going to get sex cell production. So again, that's your sperm and egg. LH has a different role. So LH is luteinizing hormone. And as we'll learn in the reproductive system, the luteinizing, right, the L part of that uh, hormone name comes from corpus luteum, right? So corpus luteum is a structure um, that appears as part of the reproductive cycle or the menstrual cycle in the female. And so we'll talk about that in more detail in, in reproduction. But essentially luteinizing hormone, what I want you to know at this stage is that it acts again on the gonads, can also act on the placenta, but again, I'm kind of negating that at the moment. So it'll act on the gonads and it's going to give you ovulation in the female and hormone production in both sexes. So this is the hormone responsible for production of estrogen and progesterone in the female and testosterone in the male. Our last hormone from the anterior pituitary is prolactin. Now it's prolactin. Lactin lactation refers to milk production. So it's not a surprise that prolactin acts at the breast. So it's going to act on the mammary glands for milk production. The other side to this, this milk ejection over here, that's oxytocin, which is coming from the posterior pituitary and it'll join down here in, in a minute. So the reason why I'm pairing these is to show you that milk production is created by prolactin, but you need milk ejection, which is regulated by oxytocin from the posterior pituitary. So that's it from anterior pituitary. And so now you can kind of see that connection between the two. So that oxytocin is acting on the breast as well for milk ejection listed over here. So our posterior pituitary, again from lecture, you'll remember that in the anterior pituitary side, the hypothalamus regulates the anterior pituitary hormones by secreting hormones on it, right? It bosses the anterior pituitary around and then the anterior pituitary makes its own hormones to secrete. The posterior pituitary doesn't do that. Instead, the hypothalamus makes all of these hormones and it sends them down to the posterior pituitary to store them and then release them. So these hormones, so oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone, are not made by the posterior pituitary. They're simply held there for a moment. So oxytocin we've talked about already in class quite a bit. Uh, oxytocin is the main kind of positive feedback loop mechanism that we talked about with childbirth. And we also talked about it a moment ago with the regulation of milk ejection. So oxytocin regulates smooth muscle contraction. In the breast, there's smooth muscle around the glandular tissue. So when it contracts, it helps eject the milk from the breast. In this way, the baby, when they're suckling, they don't have to try and suck all the milk out of the breast. 
the milk is also being forcibly ejected out of the breast. So it makes it easier on the baby. Because a baby feeding at the breast requires a lot more energy expenditure, so it's a lot harder to get milk out of a breast than it is out of a bottle. And so that's one of the reasons why this mechanism is in place. It's also there because the more the baby stimulates the breast, the more the breast uh, has sensory nerves that stimulate the brain to release prolactin to make more milk. So it, that's a nice feedback cycle too. So as the baby nurses, you have that stimulation of the breast. That breast stimulation stimulates the brain to release prolactin to make more milk to feed the hungry baby. It's a wonderful cycle. So the other place oxytocin stimulates smooth muscle contraction is the uterus. So during labor, labor and delivery, those contractions of the uterus aren't regulated by skeletal muscle. So they are regulated, well, the uterus is made out of smooth muscle. So therefore they are involuntarily controlled. And so it, it's oxytocin that gives us those uterine contractions. And again, we talked about that positive feedback loop. We know that the stimulation for this is the pressure of the baby's head against the cervix. So that pressure on the cervix stim stimulates the brain to release oxytocin. Oxytocin causes, as we can see here, uterine contractions. Contractions push the baby's head harder against the cervix. So more pressure on the cervix, more stimulation of the brain to release more oxytocin. And so the cycle continues to build until the baby is born. And then you no longer have pressure on the cervix, so you no longer have that stimulation for oxytocin, and the cycle ends. So again, important to remember there that that's a positive feedback loop, so that the stimulation is increasing, and the response is increasing, like a snowball effect, rather than the negative feedback loops that we've seen many, many times, where you have a response to something, and as soon as you reach that homeostatic set point, that happy place, that ideal situation, you also have a signal to shut that um, change off. So again, you shiver when you're cold, as soon as you warm up, and you hit that nice body temperature, the signal is to stop shivering. So that's not the system here, right? For uterine contraction and labor and delivery, you're talking about a positive feedback cycle. <clears throat> So lastly, we have antidiuretic hormone, our ADH. So ADH acts in the kidney. So when we get into the renal system, you're going to see we spend a lot of time talking about water regulation, so our hydration level, regulating blood pressure by regulating how much water we keep or excrete in our urine. And we're going to talk about electrolyte balance, acid-base balance, a lot of different things. So the kidney has a huge role to play here. But one of them, when we're talking about antidiuretic hormone, is water retention. So we know that diuretics like coffee make you pee, so they increase the, the water in your urine, so they increase water loss in your body. So an antidiuretic is a hormone that's going to decrease the amount of water in your urine and therefore increase water retention. So that's the role there. So if we zoom back out again, you can see that we covered a lot of ground and it really is quite substantial. Um, but when you break it down into the separate streams, it's very doable. So when you're studying this, please don't study the entire chart as is, right? Study the individual streams like we just went over. And that's it. Happy studying.